So Jim's most anticipated thing of 2018 is just getting a Switch. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris reveal their most anticipated releases of 2018 by playing a round of Buy, Try, or Trash. Plus, Cyberpunk 2077, Nintendo Labo, and more. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 120 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Howdy, y'all. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And today is our traditional uh, second episode of the year. We're talking about our most anticipated games of 2018. Uh, but we are breaking from tradition a little bit. We're changing up our format here. Uh, hopefully it'll become a new tradition if it works out nicely. I think it will. Uh, where instead of just sort of listing off the games and talking about them, we're going to bring back a, a fan favorite by Try Trash, uh, one of our game shows. Uh, in order to uh, make the discussion a little bit more, um, how should we say, high stakes? Spicy. Yeah, spicy. Spicy discussion. <laughs> Beasty spicy. Um, so what we're going to be doing when we get to this segment a little bit later on in the show is uh, sort of listing off a few of the honorable mentions, games that we're looking forward to but aren't kind of our top most anticipated. And then we're saving our top most anticipated for Buy, Try, Trash. And we're going to have to uh, make the heart-wrenching decision of uh, which of these uh, can we only play for a little bit, which of these get canceled and never get released. Uh, so it should be a, a fun and uh, high stakes discussion. Your animals, all of you. <laughs> uh, but first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. I kind of wanted to talk about a game I've been playing recently on and off. And um, actually, it's been a little while since our last recording. So I've actually stopped playing this game. And I want to talk about why. The game I'm referring to is Fallout 4. Oh, they made a 4. They did. So I, I will say that I enjoy the aspect of exploring the wasteland. Um, the VAT system is still entertaining. I think that they got rid of even more of the role-playing elements. Although, to be fair, I actually thought what they did with the perk system was interesting. I don't know if you, what you thought about it, Doc. But oh, yeah. They, the big screen where yes. you, yeah and i actually they, have a poster of that and so. I, yes and I, I loved it, it. it came with the game actually uh, the poster that you're mm-hmm. referring to and i actually kind of liked that change i thought that was an interesting twist as opposed to having all of the you know adding points into skills that kind of that kind of tweaked it a little bit and made it a little more streamlined yep. i didn't expect to like that part as much my main problem with the game to be honest with you is the stories are just not interesting and i don't mean just the main story mm-hmm. which is also which is boring to be fair but all the side stories, the way they populated the world, the other characters in the world, it just felt so um, empty. Yeah. I mean, is that maybe the best, I don't know if that's the best word for it. Well, but it, it is the post-apocalypse, so that yeah. might not be a fair criticism. But I think what you're really maybe saying is that it lacked depth. Yes. That that the people that you encounter don't feel like real people. They feel like scenery. Right. That's a really good way to put and it. And I would agree with that for the most part in the core game. I think the DLC did a much better job of that, but you can't judge a game by its DLC. Right. Um, That said, I know that you had a criticism going in, so you've had three years to sort of age this opinion, shall we say, of the way that the dialogue worked in the first place, which mm, was that you only had four choices. Yes, and I actually, that's, I hate the dialogue system. I mean, I really hate it. I know you do. I I feel that it's, it, it really limits what you, how you interact with the world and it makes it feel like i think if they had just gone one direction or the other like you're a character you're a person like in the witcher 3 you are Geralt right and you you react as Geralt right and you you come to terms with that that's who you are you are role playing as a as Geralt in other fallout games and earlier fallout games and in other large open world rpgs You might create your own character Mm -hmm. and yourself and you get to interact as yourself and you choose how you interact in the world and therefore you're creating your own character as you go. Sure. In Fallout 4, they kind of have this half measure where you're both. You're so limited in your choices and responses that you can make and how you can react 
react and respond to quests that because you're you're railroaded into quest all the time in this game too. Sure, which is that's one true. of the things that bugs me. Yeah. So you're not really a, a, a separate, distinct character character that they're able to develop and define and make interesting, but you're not really yourself making choices and defining who you are either. Mm-hmm. So you're neither. So it it, it feels it feels kind of like they wanted to have their cake and eat it too, to use another yet another derivative statement, which is probably in the game somewhere because there's a lot of derivative writing in this game. <laughs> there really is. I, that's my biggest complaint, and I think it's I think that's a, um, a maybe might be a strange one just because for Fallout, I've always liked the overall like the concepts and the side quests, but I've never really felt like the main storyline of Fallout, including the original, mm-hmm. was never really that that strong. And mm-hmm. I was okay with that because the world itself had so much character and the side quests were so interesting. Mm-hmm. But in this one... And the one, characters in the side quests were very interesting. Were in very interesting, yes. You remember Killian? You yes. remember him? Yes. See, that you shouldn't. I mean, by all, by all rights, you really shouldn't. Yeah. And yet you do. And, mm-hmm. and any Fallout fan that I've talked to remembers who Killian is and the context and... And that's weird. Uh, did you play the second one? You remember Sulik? Mm-hmm. Okay. See, oh, sh- I play the second one big time. And you sh- I love the you shouldn't. One. See, yeah. again, that's the argument. And, uh, you know, to, to me, I think everything you're saying is, is valid. Um, and yet, I think that we're in a in-between time, shall we say? I'm really, really looking forward to Fallout 5, whatever that is. Do you see what I'm saying? You, you get what I'm, what I'm saying? Uh, honestly, I'll, I'll say this. If... if they need to get back or uh, contact some of the people um, working at Obsidian. They need to get some of those writers into the room. I'll call Uncle Furry. Like, like, I'll, I'll make it happen. Uh, yes, yeah. or, or Chris Avalone. They need to get some of these people in there that actually know how to write nuanced characters, nuanced storylines, because Fallout New Vegas. To me, that was Fallout. That was a new Fallout game. Fallout Three felt like Oblivion with 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 guns. And, and lasers in the post-apocalypse. And Fallout 4 felt like a, a lesser version of Skyrim mm-hmm. with in the post-apocalypse. It wasn't a Fallout game, really. Not no, I really. Get, I get what you're saying. It just had Fallout skin on it. Yeah. And I'm still worried that Bethesda is simply unable. I, they have not proven to me that they are capable of making a Fallout game. And that's sad. That's unfortunate. Oh, and the other criticism I do want to mention before we move on. So I played the other ones on on. PC. I played this one on console because uh, my computer is just not that good mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. So I I can't really run anything on it now. It's kind of dead. So I'm playing on my PS4 and I couldn't mod the radio to have more music. Sure. So I'm stuck with like the five songs that are on the radio, it feels like. I can't listen to the radio. I have, yeah. I've turned it off long, long they ago. They phoned that one in. They, not only do they not pick the right, like enough song, not pick enough songs, but some of the songs they picked were really questionable choices. Yeah. And what I thought was really strange, too, is that I've complained about it on other forums before, and some of the responses were, well, there's not enough songs that really fit the post-apocalypse theme and what they were trying to do. There's less songs than there were in, like, Fallout 3. Mm-hmm. You could have just taken songs that you've used before, included them with the ones that you have now. Yeah. These aren't modern artists. It's not like it's expensive That's to get right. licensed versions. For this. this is absurd. A lot, some, a lot of the stuff was even in the public domain. That's they could have includes, included more music, and they just didn't. Yeah. There's a lot of laziness. I mean, that to me, it just encapsulates yeah. the, the design I of mean, the whole I've, game. I've picked up more empty Nuka-Cola bottles than I can stand, and yet they don't want to reuse a song. So that that's a very valid criticism. Yeah. Uh, keep in mind, you know, this is a game that that I loved. I abandoned. I went back to, and I abandoned a second time. So... What you're saying is resonating with me, not necessarily for the same reasons. Uh, I put in hundreds and hundreds of hours in that game, never actually beat it, absolutely hated what happens when you find your kid. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've recently considered going back in because there's some new DLC stuff or whatever that I never really played with and build some machines or something, but eh. Yeah, the building aspect, um, I think we're out of time for this segment, but I did want to... Uh, mention the building aspect to me was kind of disappointing as well that's unfortunate now but, do you have the dlc for the building stuff i have the game of the year edition so okay I have all so you've DLC. got all of it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay but, well i recommend I, I feel like they could have done more with it I, I feel like if you're gonna have building they should have made a uh some sort of a top-down camera or mm-hmm. something that you could more easily build it's very frustrating to have to run around and personally place things where you want sure. them and not necessarily know how it's impacting the rest of the space until you place it and walk around and kind of see. And I'm talking about moving large sure, yeah. objects like buildings and such. I, I recommend that you head straight for Nuka Land and you play that content because that is, in my opinion, one of the best 
um, world building exercises in the fallout world ever done ever. Cool. And I loved that play experience well, I, I will do that i'll check out nuclear because yeah. I, I was putting off some of the dlc until it, i got no, to higher no, level head but, straight for the dlc yeah. man um and and, and I, I gotta admit i hated the the little sub story there and i have created my own little head cannon, which was i'm lying to all these guys and and that might help you just a little bit whenever you're whenever you have to choose a dialogue option just say ah my character's lying right now and run with it um I will do that. Nuka, Nuka Land was created for to be to be an evil character though, an evil aligned character, and know that going in. Okay. Yeah, okay. Just expect that. So anyway, that's okay. So it's my character. Yeah. Oh well, there you go. See, it, it's a good fit for you. Hmm. It's time for war stories, tales of tribulation and triumph in gaming. I have a war story. Um, it's something that I wanted to love very, very deeply. I watched its development. I watched some of the alpha and beta stuff. Uh, I've waited to to play it until some of the bugs were going to be fixed. And that is Lego Worlds. Uh, The premise behind Lego Worlds is this. You have these different little, let's call them islands in space made out of Lego. Okay, and you have your little rocket ship, and you go from land to land, and they Islands have different in space. Uh huh. We call those planets. Yeah. Well, they're not though, oh. uh, especially <laughs> since they're flat. Uh, so it's kind of a little bit closer to uh, like um, Terry Pratchett's Discworld comes to mind. Uh, La- Lady Blackbird. Yeah, kinda. actually, Lady Blackbird's a, a really good reference there. Um, but each one has what we might think of as a Lego theme. So you've got the pirate theme, and you've got the space theme, and you've got the this and the that and the whatever, right? Um, so here's the problem. There is a game breaking bug that happens an inordinate amount of time. Um, and it is known on the forums. It's been around since basically April of 2017. Mm. Do the math. Okay. Um, and what it says is cannot create save game file. Um, and what that means is a really bad uh, description, but what it really means is we weren't able to connect with the online server stuff, and so we're going to permanently disable your save file and make it so that it's not recoverable. And now there's going to be a file on your on your let's call it PS4, um, which is undeletable because it's corrupt, and it's going to make it so that the game and all future saves of this game. Uh, Remember what you've discovered, but reset all your worlds. Hmm. So think what? about it in terms of, yeah, think about it in terms of um, you're, you're playing Minecraft, which is a terrible comparison because it's really an exploration game and it's not a building game. You can build in it, but that's not what the game is meant. So what you're saying is it becomes No Man's Sky, except it regenerates the universe every time. Yes, that is the, exactly it. And it's to the point where it, it steals Every single ounce of fun, it just sucks it completely out because the point of the discovery then becomes this sort of abstract, I have the blueprints for stuff and whatever I find next. Mm. And it it exactly, it felt like No No Man's Sky at that point, Lego No Man's Sky. And I just went, oh, and had to sell my copy back. I got it for Christmas Um, and I was super excited about it, but there's literally no way for me to even reformat Mm. and start over without reformatting everything on... My hard drive, you know, my PS4 hard drive. Is that a problem on the PC? Do you know, or is it just? Yeah, it's a it's a cross platform problem, hmm. which says to me that it actually is something on their end more to do with anything else. The problem hmm. is they don't know how to create the bug fix apparently, or they're just not. They're, they're literally not talking to the community about this. They they're. I I will go as far as to say they are lying about it. And saying, okay, we totally fixed it, um, re- reinstall your game, and then download your save file, and you'll be fine. And people are like, yeah, I did that not working. Mm. When, and I tried it too, when and it did didn't game, work. How long has the game been out? Over a year. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this particular bug has been out since, like I said, April of mm. 2017, almost a year. So That's really unfortunate. It feels like It sounds like to me that they're just not trying hard enough. Yeah. I understand it can be very difficult if you, because of... I've, I've experienced myself where I work. If you ha- you know that there's a bug that it exists, but you're not sure exactly how to get it to happen. Uh-huh. You just know that it's happening. So it makes it very difficult to fix. Oh, I absolutely. understand that. But if it's been out and that they've been having this problem for this long, then to me, it's like they're not really trying hard enough to fix it. Yeah. And that that's my opinion. It may be it's rare enough or something like that. But I mean, I was able to trace it uh, down to a very specific file on my own hard drive for the PS4 that I cannot delete. It, it, it basically, it says it has no data on it, but it's still indexed 
You know what I mean? And so there's a, there's a corruption in the index. That's ultimately what it comes down to. Um, and yet I, there doesn't appear to be a way to fix it. So, uh, yeah, sadly, um, Lego worlds for me is a avoid at all costs game. It's not even worth, even if it was completely working fine, eh, it would be, it would be a, an afternoon's dawdle, but, um, it's certainly not the game I, I wanted it to be, and it's certainly not the game I could have obsessed over. Mm. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, me too. I think Lego is completely bombing when it comes to the digital space. I mean, you're you you are the target audience yeah. for this game. Oh yeah, I am. So if it's not successful with you, I'm they a Lego have a guy problem. and I'm a video game guy. Yeah, and I, I love Minecraft. So yeah, I all counts. I should have just been in love with this game, and I'm not. Mm. Which honestly, I think probably is the root of the real reason is that. There's just not the call it the the flow of money to be able to put into the development for fixing that bug, because I think I think it's an empty studio at this point, probably uh, dedicated to support for that game. Mm. Grab your salt shakers because it's time for some reckless speculation. Parks used to engage with rumors, hearsay, and all sorts of crazy theories. We have multiple games that I'd, I'd really like to discuss. Um, I'd kind of like to, to just start out with uh, Cyberpunk 2077, if I could. Is mm-hmm. there any objections to that? No. I object. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. I don't even know what that is. So, And now we're going we're gonna to keep do. you, uh, dear listeners, on board as we deliberate over what we should do instead of Cyberpunk 2077. Yes. <laughs> um, no, so, uh, and you are aware of this game, uh, Doc. I'm sure I you're am? just kidding. Oh, okay. You are kidding, right? No, I'm not kidding. I literally don't know what it is. Okay, so it is the it is a game that has been in development for or, or been announced probably back in maybe 2012, I think. Yeah, it's the been first a while. Time. Yeah. And um, it is the next large open world RPG from CD Projekt Red, who made The Witcher. Right. Okay. So it is, and it is a it it is a sort of Blade Runner esque you know, cyberpunk themed oh, open great. world game. No, I had no idea. Yeah, and and CD Projekt Red has has put so much, um, you know, of of their soul into the Witcher franchise and, and everything they do. Man, I have, I have so, a super big box of forgiveness for them yes, on anything yes. they do. So they're, so I've been excited for this game because of that for, for many years, yep. but we've heard almost nothing about it for about four years. Hmm. And so recently, very recently, uh, the, this is about two weeks ago, the Twitter, the official Twitter, Twitter for, um, cyberpunk 2077 that had been silent for four years, came alive. Ooh. One tweet. You got rebooted, you could say? Yes. You know what the tweet said? Does anybody know? No. Beep. <laughs> now that's funny. Yes. But but it's also it's also now active. And there's been um, um, also talk that it has been confirmed they are going to show off Cyberpunk 2077 at E3. You know, they were year? just testing their password. Yeah. That's what that was, right? <laughs> Maybe so. They're Maybe like, so. Oh, we lost the password for that account. Let's see. Uh, we'll call a guy. And, and what is it? Oh, sweet. We got it working. Well, we need to test it. What are we going to say? It's been beep. like three years. <laughs> I don't know. Just say beep. Uh, but it... <laughs> Now I, I will I will say that the the excitement for this game and the hype for this game is is so high not just with me but just in the gaming community that that one tweet sparked off a series of articles because that is how excited people are for this game and how much respect they have for CD Projekt Red. Yeah. Of course, because they're coming off of The Witcher Three, which in my opinion is one of the greatest gaming accomplishments in quite some time. I agree. So Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven because it, it combines. Uh, that R- that RPG, open world RPG, and great sense of storytelling and lore building, and it combines that with cyberpunk, which is still pretty popular, pretty oh, in. Oh yes, Blade um, Runner. Yeah, uh, people, people, it, it's resonated with people, and so they've been able to keep their hype alive despite not really hearing much about the game for four years. So now here we are, E3 2018, it's coming, and there's also talk of there being a closed door playable demo at E3, which means it is probably not going to come out this year just based on where we are, but it's very possible that it will come out early next year. And so I I do want to talk a little bit about just recklessly speculate. When is this game? First of all, is the game coming out at all? When might it come out? And what's our expectation for it? Christmas 2019. Christmas 2019. Yeah. So Q4 2019. Okay. Now you know what to get me for Christmas. 
Okay. <laughs> you give me a copy. I'll get you a copy. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I could see that. I could see that happening. Because I'm not going to wait for you to finish playing. Right. This time. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> this, this is this is funny because see, I, I actually started playing Witcher three because of Jim's copy, and I had it for like months and months yeah. and months and months. So. I also yeah. poked you repeatedly to play it. It's true. Like, you play did. It. And I was play like, it. I don't know. I don't know. Just play it. You'll like it. I don't know. But uh, no, nah, that that excites me. Um, that's a genre that I enjoy. I think that um, there's a lot of game to be had in that space. And I think it's been done badly. Um, and if there's anybody who can do it right, it's CD Projekt Red. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. Chris, what do you think? I'm very excited for it. I don't know if I have too much to add beyond that um, <laughs> because we haven't like, we haven't seen anything about the gameplay. The only thing we've really gotten is like that first teaser trailer. Yes. Um, and that was very artful and very cool, but didn't really hint too much of what the gameplay is going to be like. Don't even necessarily know who you're playing as unless maybe I'm misremembering. Right. No, yeah. No, like, are, are we you, don't know. We are don't you know. the androids that are being hunted down or are, are you the police or, you know, and how what's... much has changed since that trailer? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they've learned so much from all the all the the work they put into witcher 3 and all the expansions for witcher 3 the dlc that, yes oh, the man. blood and wine is yeah. brilliant so all the work that they've put into it it could be conceived as a different game now mm-hmm. and i've there's also been talk that they scrapped all of their work at one point and restarted and so we don't know exactly wh- what state the game is in at this point right mm-hmm. Um, I, I am interested though to see what it is. I think I'm going to probably be into it. I, I'm definitely highly anticipating it. Um, one way or the other, whatever it ends up being. Uh, well, next up on the docket, another really huge game that's been delayed for a while. Red Dead Redemption 2. RDR 2. I loved him in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this game's coming. It's been confirmed for 2018. And not just that, they, they're saying that it could be late quarter one, early quarter two. So we could we could see this game, and it, it hasn't have a, a set release date, but we could see it around March, April. I mean, that's as early as we that's can see it. That's kind of crazy, actually. Yeah. And it, it, I don't expect it, and, and that's my regular speculation. I think it's going to be more like the Q2, summer. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be more like July-ish that we might see it, June. That makes sense. Um, but it's still very exciting. Mm-hmm. Well, I think summer would be a really smart time because releasing games in early summer, you get the kids involved. Of course, no kids are going to play this game because it's rated. Exactly. Yeah. I was going to so, point that out. Yeah, no so kids play rated Obviously, M that's games. not a factor. But right. uh, teachers, see, that's what's going to happen. The teachers get out of school. They're like, I need to shoot something. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, former teacher. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I, I, like, I like the idea of a sequel to one of my favorite all-time games ever. And I'm also terrified. I will just say that right now. I think they're going to screw it up. I think they're going to break it. I think they're going to focus on the wrong things like online play. I think they're going to get greedy. And I think that um, the delays that have happened are not going to have added anything substantive to the single player uh, core Mm. game. But I think that that it is undeniable that Rockstar is going to pull some from GTA 5 because it is a monumentally successful game, a game that is still in the, in the top um, 10 sellers and oftentimes in the top three sellers month to month. And I'm talking about the actual game itself, not even, not even referring to people buying like shark cards or DLC. I mean, the literal game itself is that is still selling at that level to this day. So this is, we're talking about a massively successful game. So of course they're going to borrow from it. My reckless speculation, first off, and I don't even know if this is really that far out there. I don't think this has been confirmed though. Um, there will be multiple playable characters. I, I'm saying that right now. There will be. And I don't mean in the sense of like the first Red like Dead five. Redemption. I mean like five, where yeah. you're switching between characters, which honestly I thought was a very effective storytelling tool. And it can be again as long as they're careful and they play it right. It could it could be again. And here's what I'm hoping they do. One of my all-time favorite Westerns, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And if Rockstar, they know their pop culture. Right. They're oh. British, but they know their they know their American pop culture. Yeah. And and th- because this is a Western, I don't know if they can resist doing the same thing, looking at it and going, we have a Western. We want to have play play as multiple characters. Right. And, you know, play having more than three that you're controlling and switching between is going to be pretty tough. It's a pretty tall order. Yeah, three is pretty, pretty like the tops. So what if they go three? You know, somebody in the back room had to say, what about good, the bad and the ugly? And what if that's what they do? What if instead of having three characters that are basically working together more or less throughout the game, like in GTA Mm five, what if instead you have three characters with different goals that at times their, their paths cross sometimes, sometimes with animosity 
Sometimes they have to work together temporarily, but they are not allies mm-hmm. like in the good, the bad, and the ugly. That could be interesting to me. And if they go that route, I think we could we could be looking at um, a incredible gaming experience, something that we haven't really seen before, because I don't know, that hasn't really been done successfully, where you have, you're, you're playing as these three different characters, and um, you're in the same game space. And just like in GTA V, you can switch between them once you unlock them all at any, at any point, and they all have different missions that they can take. But one of them is the good guy, the white hat, right? The white hat. Like Chris. Cowboy. Sure, like Chris. Um, oh, we're going that route. Okay, all right, all right. I'm with you, I'm with you. Uh, one of them is the white hat, right? And they're, and they're going around trying to do what's right and and possibly to bring one of the other, other three to justice. Sure, yeah. Then one of them is the bad. This is the bad guy, the, the quintessential, you know, black hat. The guy right. who goes around and, you know, he's he is um, out for himself and he's going to do whatever it takes to get his way. That's you. Hashtag Jim back. Possibly so. And then we have. Wait, I don't like where that yeah. last thing. <laughs> 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 Hold on. Oh, you, it's too late now. Oh, dang it. Too late now. <laughs> Better ugly than evil. Uh, and then we have true. the ugly, the <laughs> ugly, which was, um, you know, our, in my opinion, actually the most entertaining character of that movie, to That's be honest, true. because he was hilarious. And he is I'll the he's not the, the the toughest of the bunch. He's not the, the like a great gunfighter like the other two were, mm-hmm. but he could certainly hold his own. And his thing was he was he was slippery, and he was you know he would do whatever whatever he needed to do, and he would he would find this like uh, the, the the slimy back Chaotic door, neutral, yeah, got the, it. the the back door way to to succeed. But they all had their different their different takes on things, and yet they all had at one point the same goal that they had to that they sort of had to work towards. And like at some point, you might work with one of them against the other one mm-hmm. and at other points it swat it switches but, That's at, clever. At, but at the end maybe you have that three-way duel the mexican standoff and you have to pick hey who am i going to control to kill the other two okay so we can never air this episode chris <laughs> because what's going to happen is Someone's rockstar who are loyal fans are going to be like that's way better than the crap we came up with let's delay this game right, for another right, seven right. years and i am worried too I, we didn't really touch as much on it but i i am definitely worried that the online component has taken a large portion of their production time Mm -hmm. um i still want to believe in their single player experience because so far they haven't let me down in terms of just content wise like in terms of the the amount of work and and love they put into it regardless of whether you enjoy gta 5 you can't deny how much um work Mm -hmm. went into that single player game Mm -hmm. it was it was you know easily a 60 hour experience of a single just the single player alone Mm -hmm. so if they put that much effort into red dead redemption 2 regardless of how much effort they put in the online i think people will be satisfied Doc, you want to take us in on Nintendo Labo? Talk some about that. Oh, yeah. Now, how do I pronounce this? Uh, Labo? La- Lamo? I would go with Labo. The Nintendo Lamo. Don't, don't, yeah, don't pronounce it Lamo. <laughs> the, the Nintendo <laughs> Lama. Labo? Labo? L- Labo? 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 I don't know. I, I had a black Labo whenever I was a kid. <laughs> nice dog. Very sweet. Um, <laughs> uh, let, let's go with Labo. Okay. This is the cardboard thing. Right. This is, um, I mean, they couldn't call it Nintendo cardboard because right. Google has a cardboard, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's, yeah, and that it would raised, work. It raised a lot of eyebrows because it was the, what? They're going to charge us $70 for cardboard? Well, yeah. And, and a disc. Well, mm-hmm. it's not really a disc. You get it's software a, with it too. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's, it's those little cartridges that everyone loses. Um, so this is for Switch, obviously. And what's really caught my eye was I was looking at these cardboard punch outs that people were folding together and they're putting it in and they were creating little robots and, and pianos and things. And I'm going, how does that work? And I was instantly captivated by going, okay, there's like 10 keys on that keyboard. How is it sensing those key? What Which element mm-hmm. of the Switch, which I thought I knew pretty well now, is doing that? Am I required to have a a different Joy-Con for each key? You know, because that that's cost no, prohibitive. They, yeah, they they're not doing that. That certainly doesn't seem to be the case. But I'm with you. It, it's it's pretty impressive. I mean, I'm not. Uh-huh. It's very impressive what what they're able to seemingly yeah. do. Not just for things like playing the piano, but it's also for. Um, you're going to create your own setup so that you can have like this harness thing so you can play like say a fishing game yeah. and like throw out cast a reel or something uh-huh. you know that's that's just neat. And, and and that looks a little i don't know um nerve-wracking to me you've got your you've got your very expensive uh three hundred dollar switch stuck in the back of a cardboard backpack what happens whenever i flail around a little bit or my kid flails around a little bit and it falls out and crack it's probably going to be fine it's nintendo 
They, you, you drop those all the time. They'll be fine. Maybe. I mean, <laughs> I, and so I have some concerns logistically, uh, but my concerns have nothing to do with a $70 price tag. If you know what I mean, don't get into a $300 system, which by the way is super cheap mm-hmm. for, for what's in there. Um, don't get into a $300 system where you're paying $60 a game and then start whining because something's made out of cardboard which, when it's functional, which you also don't have to buy. Yeah, exactly. No one's forcing you to buy. It. Um, and, 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 in, and the arguments of, uh, well, that's for kids. I salute the fact mm-hmm. that Nintendo is embracing kids and that demographic. We, so, Jim, you were talking about that or before the show. What I think is brilliant about yeah. this is that it's allowing you to make custom peripherals, uh, like unlimited possibilities. You can make as many different peripherals as you want for very specific applications. I love what you just said there. Um, unlimited possibilities. And it's very, very cheap. It's not going to cost you either on the manufacturer side or the customer side, like, you know, the $60, um, you know, Guitar Hero mm-hmm. guitars or whatever else. Like every time you buy one of those, it's like 40 to 60 bucks. I, I totally forget. went to right. Bill and Ted right then with the air guitars. And, <laughs> and, and you know, they're going to have like sets of once you, once you make everything that you can with the cardboard, totally. because the cardboard sets, uh, when you buy them, I keep calling the cardboard, but they, I mean, they are, but, um, the Labo sets, the mm-hmm. no Labo sets, when you buy it, it comes with everything that you need to make all the stuff that you saw in the trailer mm-hmm. for those that, yeah. that watch the trailer. So, but they're going to sell additional sets. Mm-hmm. So that and you, like for like 10 bucks or something like that, which right. is. Like again, but they're going to make a lot of bank. They're going to make money off of that. Yeah, no, it, it's, that's it's, my it's high margin, it's but it's money. also very cheap. Like it, <laughs> that's that's the that's an impulse purchase. Yeah, uh, you go to the store and like, hey, that one looks interesting. Let's grab that. Um, <laughs> Has the pricing been announced? I, the, I think it's basically yeah, like the seventy dollars for like the core kit. So right. like the disc and the few would come with it. And okay, then I think it's like. I, I've heard 10 bucks, but I don't know if that's official. Okay, so that makes sense to me. So you buy the core kit. You've got, let's say, three pieces of mm. uh, whatever that comes out of that for the, the three cool things, including, I hope, the piano. Mm. And then I can go down to the store, and I can also get, for 10 bucks another cardboard thing, which I already have the software for, or... I mean, or people can make new games that happen to use Libo. See, that's what I think. It doesn't, it doesn't always have to yes. be the same game. That's what I'm thinking too. Is that they're going to have um, additional? You know, I hesitate to use the word. It's a little dirty word, but DLC, uh, where you can just get extra little pieces. Downloadable like, cardboard. Yes, downloadable <laughs> cardboard. Exactly. Um, you can get your your extra little little piece of extra little like game. But the other cool thing is that there's going to probably be games that are released that have elements of them where okay, you can play this game with a controller. Or mm-hmm. you can use, you can create like the Labo, you know, set and have um, my Labo sword that I swing around. That actually makes a right? lot of or sense. Or my Labo, you know, fishing reel. Like if I'm playing, say, you know, Animal Crossing and now I'm going to do some fishing, oh, I can use the Labo fishing reel Lots if I want to. Lots of stuff to lob. Got mm-hmm. it. Yes. Yeah. And, and developers can um, prototype. They can make their own custom peripherals. And if they want to release a game with that, they can, they can basically build a cardboard thing, test it out, and then like just formalize it when they sell it. Um... Let me take it from there, because <laughs> what what I see is an actualization of our imagination that's been in the, let's call it the we space mm-hmm. for a decade now, what, decade and a half. Mm-hmm. And, and that's simply this. Whenever I've played with a fishing rod and I've had that Wiimote, right, I've imagined that fishing rod in my hand. Well, now I can actually hold that cardboard thing in my hand and they've solved the problem. I mean, do, do you remember, have you ever, ever been to like uh, one of those hunting and fishing stores? This is Texas, so we got tons of those. And you go to that one place where they got the video Bass games. Bass Pro Shop. Bass Pro, yeah. right? And they've got the orange, like it's like this big plastic uh, rod and reel that's made for yes. Wii. And yes. then they've got the gun mm-hmm. and they've got the, you know, the deer hunter and all. They've got all these peripherals. And they don't, it's funny because they don't sell these in like GameStop. You have to go to a Bass Pro to get this because it's licensed. Um, but if you've ever been in there, and I've been in there with my, my father-in-law a number of times, you see these things and it's hilarious. And I actually inherited a few, which I've never actually played. <laughs> to me, this bridges that gap. It's no longer plastic junk. Mm-hmm. It's cardboard mm-hmm. junk, but it's cheaper. Mm. It's disposable. It's more accessible. <laughs> and and I could see people too taking the same technology, the same approach. And I think it's going to be based largely on IR. Um, when you stick the um, one of the Joy-Con in there, it's got a little IR sensor on the right. end. So it's probably going to be using that for a lot of the stuff. My guess is that like there's a little mechanical implement that when you uh, flip a switch or pull a lever or something like that, it might show like a little reflective dot that the IR sensor can pick up or something like that. Oh, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work, but that's kind I, of I would explain impression. how the keys work. Yeah. There's got to be rubber bands in there too somehow. There might be. Something possibly. like that. To, to me, there's another place to look at, or another way to look at this, and that's this is augmented reality 
turned on its head. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean when I say that? I mean, normally we're looking at augmented reality reality as uh, something we can only see through the screen about real reality. Mm -hmm. And now we're taking real stuff in order to be able to see the stuff on the screen differently. Hmm. It's a, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of the equal and opposite end flip side of the coin of augmented reality. Hmm. And to me, that's super cool. Let's see. So the other game I wanted to talk a little bit about in this, uh, in reckless speculation, the last one here, um, apparently there, there are several rumors going around and have been, um, percolating and building this month about a possible spiritual successor to, um, Link's Awakening, which is one of my favorite Legend of Zelda games, came out on, for the Game Boy uh, many, many years ago. Um, you know, and this is sort of going to be the, like, Link Between Worlds was a spiritual successor to Link of the Past, and I thought it was an excellent game for the 3DS. This is for 3DS? For the 3DS. There's going to be another okay. one, a Link's Awakening spiritual successor, um, developed by um grezzo i might be mispronouncing that but they are a um, japanese studio that is that was also behind the remakes for ocarina of time and majora's mask mm-hmm. for 3ds uh they've also made ever oasis if anyone played that action rpg for the 3ds which was pretty good um so if it is anything like link between worlds in terms of creating the same capturing the same um the same tone and aesthetic and um gameplay as link to the past but putting it in like a new spin, new light on it. If they do that for Link's Awakening, I'm very excited and completely on board for this game. Hmm. Any thoughts on this? Anything yeah, no, I, th- I think it's a, a logical step to take. Um, I think it'd be cool. Um, I don't know. I guess, like you said, it's not really officially announced yet. So uh, still very much in the reckless speculation phase, which is the segment. So um, if it comes out, I think it'd be interesting. I actually never played through Link's Awakening. And I've like, I've seen enough about it and I've seen other people t- play it and talk about that. I take it back. You are the black hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like uh, I've pretty much seen everything I need to without having played it. Um, but I'd be interested to play a, um, a follow up to it for sure if that came out. I'm going to give it a big meh because it's 3DS, <laughs> which is a system which does absolutely nothing for me and hurts my eyes. <laughs> so. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. So like we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we're going to be talking about our most anticipated games of 2018. And the way we're doing that this year is we're actually going to be uh, bringing back one of our favorite games. So we call it Buy, Try, or Trash. It's madness. <laughs> now, the way that this works basically is we're going to list three games. And if you buy it, it means you get to keep the game. You get to play it as long as you want, as many times as you want, etc. Uh, if you try it, it's almost like playing the demo when you go to a store or something like that. You get to play it for, you know, an hour, maybe uh, maybe a few more hours if you want to be generous with it. But the idea is that you get to play it once for a little while. You don't get to complete it. Um, and then you put it away forever. If you trash something, uh, you're actually canceling the game. Uh, so these most anticipated games we're talking about, they're coming out sometime this year. Uh, you're saying which one of these uh, you're going to have to just say, nope, it's not coming out. Uh, I don't get to play it. No one gets to play it. Uh, that's what happens when you say you're trashing the game. You're a monster. <laughs> Uh, but before we do that, we're going to quickly go through and we're each going to mention some of the games that we're looking forward to that won't be featured in that game um, to kind of get through like all the other ones that we think uh, we're looking forward to this year that we're keeping our eye on, but aren't necessarily our top most anticipated. Uh, so, Jim, do you want to go first? So uh, the first one that I see on the list, uh, Nino Kuni 2. This is the sequel to a um, Hayao Miyazaki um, art- artistic you know, inspiration RPG that came out for the PS3 that I never got to play because I didn't own a PS3 and it never got ported to any other, any other, you know, into the PS4, much to my dismay. So I'm interested to see what they do with the sequel. I heard the original was actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, I like, um, Hayao Miyazaki's, um, you know, films. I like his art style. Um, I think he's, I think he's a strong storyteller. Mm -hmm. Now, will that translate to games? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how closely he was involved. Actually. I know it was a collaboration with studio Ghibli, but I'm not sure if it was Miyazaki himself. Uh, uh, I, I just involved. know the I just know mm-hmm. the art style was clearly yeah. that's his art style. Mm-hmm. I don't, but you're right. I don't know how involved he was in the story. Mm-hmm. But regardless, my my understanding from what I heard is that it was a really um, well told story for what it was. It's targeted a little bit more toward younger players, it seems like, but still like you know a- appreciable by adults. It just was you know it's a story about a child and it's kind of like a uh, a lighter JRPG. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to that one. 
So one of my all-time favorite games of all time forever is Spider-Man 2 for the GameCube. One of the reasons for that is the uh, use of Mysterio, who is, in my opinion, a a deeply underappreciated Spider-Man villain. Oh, I like Mysterio, too. Uh, Yes, Mysterio, especially in that game, was awesome because it was like, oh, New York is under alien attack, and it was all Hollywood special effects, right? We never got to have our Bruce Campbell Mysterio. No, we never did, and that is very, very sad. So I actually know very little about the 2008 uh, announced Spider-Man, except that I won't like it. Uh, I am just prejudiced against it because uh, even though I want to have the love for Spider-Man that I once did, um, there's just been too many reboots. There's been too much litigation. I don't know if you know the whole story behind Spider-Man and Marvel and and who owned what and Sony Mm -hmm. and this and that. But honestly, Spider-Man's been rebooted so many times. I'm just kind of sick and and I'm I'm over the Spider Man, if you will. Uh, Tobey Maguire was kind of the sweet spot for me with with the Spider Man movies, and I liked all that. But then they they did the other stuff. Interested to see how the gameplay comes out with the new Spider Man. Um, I don't think that there's really been duplicated the this sort of fun open world, um, actual New York gameplay that was in that one uh, back in in when it went two on GameCube. But I saved more girls balloons than I care to admit, <laughs> and I think that we're in a new generation of gaming which won't accept that kind of repetition. I agree. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, so, it's all about saving boys' balloons. Right. That's <laughs> all we can do. Sure. Um, boys can have hey, balloons too, You know, pink, pink balloons, blue balloons, whatever, man. It doesn't matter. Um, I guess what I'm saying is this. I, I really hope that they have a good Spider-Man and they do it right, um, but uh, it's, not, it's not for me at this point in my life. Yeah, I'm also interested to see what they do with this one, because I know this developer has a pretty good reputation. Um, And so I know there have been a few other Spider-Mans that some people have said were like, you know, pretty decent experiences, but I don't think anything quite matched Spider-Man 2. Um, so seeing a, a new reboot of that that actually does well, um, I would I'm, 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 I'm interested to see uh, how it turns out, how it's received, um, but not necessarily on my like sort of top anticipated games. Uh, one that I am looking forward to, actually, is uh, Bayonetta 3. Um, I'm pretty sure that's been announced for this year. At the very least, I know what's coming out is um, a re-release of Bayonetta 1 and 2 uh, for the Switch. And I think that those might actually be included with 3. Um, yes, I believe that's true. And because I've actually never played those games, I've I've seen a good chunk of them, but never got to play them myself. And so uh, having them come out on the Switch is a great opportunity for me to kind of try those out for the first time. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. So another game I, I'm actually really looking forward to, and this is very similar to you as well, Chris. So there was a game that came out, an RPG for the original DS uh, called Radiant Historia. And it was sort of billed as um, kind of a mix of, of the Suikoden series and, um, you know, Chrono Trigger and some other uh, like Final Fantasy, other 16-bit and um, 32-bit RPGs. I never really got around to playing it, but I heard a, I heard a lot of great things. Actually, nothing but good things. Well, they're coming out with a um, sort of a remake, enhanced remake with extra content and and you know graphics called uh, Radiant Historia: Perfect Chronology. And so I've I've been following that. I'm interested to see um, just what they do with that game. And I am planning to pick it up uh, day one on 3ds. I want to talk for a second about a way out. Um, oh yeah. I remember we talked about this briefly on a previous podcast. Yeah. Yeah. This is the prison one where Mm -hmm. there's the split screen and you're telling two stories at once and it happens in uh, something similar to Mm -hmm. real time. What, what really interests me about this actually is that it's the same guys, uh, directors, if you will, um, who did brothers, a tale of two sons. Mm -hmm. And that was a fun game with the partnership and the co-op and that sort of thing. Now, my understanding is you can play this, um, or rather you have to play this as, as two players. It is like, there's no single player option, right? But it, but it is online, but you can play it online. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's the thing. But that, I think, I think that dilutes the experience mm. to some extent um if it's not couch co-op if you will and and having your buddy next to you or whatever um so i'm actually really interested in playing this specifically with my brother-in-law mm. uh, when he comes into town and um and getting it and playing it through with him because we have this fun little history of playing games with those sort of split screen side by sides there aren't that many that do it but like um the matrix mm-hmm. uh on what is it reloaded or something uh <laughs> that one had had that kind of element in it we would switch out levels and play the various characters and that kind of thing so uh, i could i could see that happening it's a prison story so i'm a little bit like i don't know but uh, i'm willing to give it a shot a game that has actually been anticipated for a while that I, I didn't anticipate as well, maybe a few years ago, more much more so than I am now, Shinmu 3. Um, it is 
there are strong rumors that it's coming out this year. Um, it is has been in development. It got a, a lot of money off of Kickstarter. And they are planning to uh, – they've been talking about re-releasing um, the second Shenmue as well as part of that um, release. So the reason why it's not one of my main picks, to be honest with you, is that um, I've been getting into so into the Yakuza series lately. And to me, it feels like Shenmue is almost a precursor, if you will, to Yakuza. And um, it, it Yakuza has that open world um, plus – combat experience that that shinmu had as well um with a lot of little like side side stories and and very very like sega inspired because it's made by sega just like shinmu originally was as well um so i think it's kind of taken the place of shinmu so i don't know if there's much room for shinmu 3 nowadays uh sorry <laughs> <laughs> but it is a big game coming out supposedly this year so one that I heard about just recently that I'm actually uh, quite intrigued by is Mech Warrior 5. Um I remember when I was younger uh, I used to like be able to play the demos for like I think it was Mech Warrior 2 or something like oh, that. Oh yeah. And I was very was very interested in those, uh never very good at them, uh but I was just like really fascinated cuz I really loved flight simulators at the time and so mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh hey, this is like a flight simulator with a giant robot." Right. Um and so I'm very interested to see. I know there've been a few other mech games that have come out um not in recent years, but say like on the PS3 there were a few that I was kind of interested in checking out. Um, supposedly very popular kind of simulationist, uh, but I never really got into those. And I think Mech Warrior, um, at least for me, is probably the most likely to do that genre, right? That uh, makes the, sense. The kind of giant robot simulationist combat. Yeah. Um, so I'm definitely interested to see uh, how that one turns out. Man, that is a weird, weird subculture because there's so much deep, rich history behind, um, I would call them the many alt worlds of Mech Warrior, if mm-hmm. you will, to the point where just calling it Mech Warrior, people will go on a rant about how it's not really called that and originally it was this and it was <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Right. But you kind of have two camps on this and it's what you might call the casuals Mm -hmm. and then the, the hardcore serious is, and I'm really curious where they're going to fall on this. Um, and, and, and some of the new video games, what I would love to see is battle pods. Mm -hmm. Remember the old, the old battle pods that you go into a pod and you'd have like the, the experience, the PVP experience. Um, I would love to see some of that with some of these new games that are coming out. And I want to see them to show up on a mall. Oh, like you mean an arcade? Uh, yeah, okay. mean, like yeah. like virtual on yeah. at the arcades. Yeah, is like this, that. Is what, this is what yeah. I want. Um, so I want to be able to crawl into a pod, and I want to be able to get into my mech, and I want to be able to 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 shoot Jim uh, <laughs> in his mech, and that's that's what I really want. And so, um, I'm, sure, that could be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm yeah. kind of hoping that 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 franchise will go in that direction. A uh, little little bonus uh, reckless spec right there. Mm-hmm. Anthem is one that I'm interested in. Uh, it's a new Bioware game, and it's kind of a open world sci-fi shooter uh, co-op. And what's interesting about it, though, is that it's a new direction for Bioware in the sense that they're not really trying oh, to do like new, a new direction. Are they, are they going to make a good game this time? Maybe. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, um, it, my faith has been shaken in Bioware recently, obviously, um, <laughs> for a lot of people, especially after uh, Andromeda. And also but, Jim. But they're not trying to <laughs> do like the story driven RPG stuff that they're kind of known for. This is actually just it looks like it's an action oriented game. Uh, and so I'm curious to see how that turns out for them, because hmm. it, the trailers that I've seen, some of the demos, um, some really interesting ideas, like the movement looks really interesting and the way that you can kind of go around the world and do different stuff. Uh, I'm intrigued. Um, so I'm curious to see uh, whether or not that turns out well. Oh, Fortnite. <laughs> you know, I uh, I talk about Fortnite kind of like I talk about an old middle school girlfriend. It's a long time ago, and it's about what could have been. <laughs> and the thing about it is, I could play it. I could play it right now. I could go, um, well, pay to do this. I'm going to read from uh, Wikipedia here. It says, it is a co-op sandbox survival video game developed by Epic Games and People Can Fly, the former also publishing the game. The game was released as a paid early access title for Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, PS4, and Xbox One on July 25th, 2017, with a full free-to-play release expected in 2018. So here's the problem. Without a designated release time, I think that what they may have been attempting to do here was create the large fan base uh, alpha phenomenon of a Minecraft. And we're past that. I think we're just basically past that um, for for sort of all games, if you will, the sort of no man's sky phenomenon. We're over it, uh, and and I think that what we really need is to just accept that if you want 
the players to fund the development of your game, you need to say openly, um, you can fund the development of our game, but, and this is where I, I come up against a wall because that's kind of what they're doing. And the problem that I have with it is I don't want to pay 50 bucks for a game that's eventually going to be free. And yet I also kind of want to play this game and I would have been happy to be a part of the alpha slash beta. So it puts me in an awkward position because it's challenging two of my core values at once. I don't want to pay for a free thing, but I also don't want them to lie about what it is they're doing. Um, that said, the gameplay itself, I've been very, very interested in because it's all about discovering blueprints for stuff. It's about building stuff, forts specifically. Uh, it's about surviving the night. And it's all that stuff that I loved about um you know, Minecraft and games like it. So when it becomes free to play, I will probably just suck it up, download it and play it. But I won't have been on the ground floor and I won't be able to say I was in it since alpha, which, you know, I can say about Minecraft. Mm -hmm. So eh, Fortnite. So I, I have a, a one that I actually forgot to even put up here, but is it, I am interested in this coming out next year. Um, and that is the last night. I don't know if y'all remember seeing that. I believe it was at E3 last year, but possibly two years ago. Is this K-N-I-G-H-D? No. Okay. No. Is this L-A-S-T? Yes. Uh, so this <laughs> oh, is wow. this is a um, cy cyberpunk, another cyberpunk game that is uh, slated for this year. And it is um, a it been called a cinematic platformer in the and a, sort of a in the vein of um, another world. In fact, that was considered one of the inspirations for this game. Doc, I'm sure you remember another world. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is this is um, meant to evoke some of that, but also with all of the. Um, visual style aesthetics and storytelling um, of a, a cyberpunk world, a cyberpunk dystopia, um, somewhat similar to Blade Runner. So um, I'm interested in kind of seeing where that game goes. My only uh, concern is that it's only on the Xbox One and a window, Microsoft Windows, and I currently don't have a PC that can play it, nor do I have an Xbox One. So that's why it's not really on my final list. Detroit Become Human. Um... I watched a few of the trailers. <laughs> it's cyberpunk too. Yeah, it's also cyberpunk <laughs> actually. Um, I, I watched some of the trailers and I'm interested. Like for all its faults, Heavy Rain I actually found to be a really neat experiment in, oh, I agree. in storytelling in video games. And so this seems to be kind of building upon that tradition. And I don't know if the gameplay is actually going to reflect this, but the trailers I saw kind of had this whole premise of they show a scene play out in kind mm. of a bad way. And they said this could have gone differently. And then they sort of show you all the different ways that you can make different choices to make the paths mm. diverge. And I mean, it's it's it's, it's quantic dream, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I mean, yeah. they're not really it's not really gameplay. Someone worries so much about that. OK, <sighs> <laughs> we're not going to get into that right now. Um, but I'm, I am very interested in the in the setting and the premise and um in kind of more experimentation in the non-linear storytelling mm -hmm. approaches. So um, this is one that I am definitely keeping an eye on. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I think about with Heavy Rain was that they, they had the option for uh, turning off. Um, it, it was basically the QTE stuff, the quick time stuff. And it was called story mode. Mm -hmm. And it was basically you can literally just choose a story thing mm -hmm. and it happens. And it's not about trying to to get the, the you know, hitting the X not to die mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. and. To me, um, I always encourage my students to to play through the way they wanted to first and then play the other mode and experience and make different choices and experience it. And then uh, to sit down and watch someone else play the game. Mm. And that if you had not watched someone else play Heavy Rain, you had not seen Heavy Rain. And to me, I think that is a profound experience, a sort of an aha moment for all gamers is to watch something as thick and heavy in the decision making and the, uh, you know, the, the ergodic elements of the branching narrative uh, to watch someone else go through it in a completely different way. And, and, and also there was a shut up portion to that, which was sit on the couch, shut up, don't say anything. Mm. Um, not, not, you know, not, oh, it's that thing over there, go get it. You know, let them make their own errors. If this game um, takes that, magnifies it, amplifies it, whatever, um, I think there's going to be something really powerful here, and it's going to be my new example. Um, if not, eh, it'll be more of the same of, of Heavy Rain, and, you know, it was an okay thing, and I'll probably play it. 
Or um, I'll probably watch a Let's Play of it and get the same experience. No! <laughs> no, you won't. You might, but that, I mean, you that, won't get that, the same experience. That, that might count as your um, watch someone else play it portion the doc requires. Well, that's true. Yeah, so. that's good. There's, there's something to that. Plus, I don't think they can call it a Let's Play if you're not really playing a game. Yeah. Uh, so real quick, I'm going to mention just like a, kind of a two for one. These aren't necessarily new releases, but they're um, expansions of releases that are already out there. First of all, Civilization VI is coming out with a new um, expansion. Civilization VI Rise and Fall, uh, adding some really interesting new features to the game i won't go into right now but i'm definitely looking forward to that and then the other one uh, that's kind of interesting is kentucky route zero is coming out with a tv edition uh, for consoles but part of that is that they're actually finally coming out with episode five uh there was always planned to be a five episode series and it was an episodic game that had like two or three years between episodes yes, it did. so i'm not sure like how episodic it really is it is um i played through like the first three acts um and i haven't played four which i think is out um but i have i i just figured i'll wait for the whole game to be out so now that it is going to all be out uh go ahead and revisit that check out kentucky route zero um it's a very uh surreal experience which i think is the whole point um and then finally just like a really quick shout out uh one of my t- most anticipated games of this year that um is already out so it's not anticipated anymore um uh, but our good friends over at poly night games uh finally came out with inner space uh which they uh had a kickstarter for a few years back um and i was really looking forward to uh so that was one of my most anticipated and now i actually have it awesome i feel like we'd be remiss not to mention kingdom hearts 3 yes we're aware of it no i haven't played anything in the series so um I might check it out. But... Leia is my favorite Disney princess. <laughs> Actually, um, mine is the um, Alien Queen. From, they, from they, the movie they, Alien? They own the, the Xenomorph? They own the Alien franchise now, too. Oh, okay. So. It's time for Game Show, where the backward compatible crew play a game show kind of game on their gaming show. What sort of crazy game show challenges in store this week on Game Show? Let's find out right now on Game Show. So we're, we're going to play Buy, Try, Trash. And uh, one of us, we're going to go around the room and we're going to pick someone's list. I'm going to pick uh, uh, Chris. I'm going to pick you first. I'm going to pick three of the games that are on his list. And he's going to do a Buy, Try, Trash with those three. Now, this is stuff we haven't talked about uh, yet. Yes. The, uh, we have curated our list we've chosen beforehand and there are going to be overlaps so some of us are going to in fact there's a couple of games up here that all three of us have have picked as our anticipated games that we want to include on this list so i'm going to just pick three at random and and give you that difficult choice of which which are you going to buy um which means you get to play it as much as you want you own the game which you're going to try which is you get to sample it you get to play it for what do we, what do we normally say like an hour a couple hours yeah. you know but but you but that's it you can never play any more of it you're done that's it you just get to experience it and put it down and then trash is you never get to play this game not yep. not it, 2018 it canceled, never not comes ever out. it gets canceled it never comes out or actually i, I don't even know about the see i don't, don't want to do the cancel i want other people to play it and experience it and tell you <laughs> that they love it it's the best game ever and you never get to play it. that's much worse <laughs> no, so that's what we're doing well, for trash you never get to play I, it. I, I in my head canon it's still canceled <laughs> because i actually wanted to call the game by try cancel but by try trash just has a better ring to it it really so. does okay so let's get started chris i'm going to pick red dead redemption 2 mm-hmm. metroid prime 4 mm-hmm and valkyria chronicles 4 so this may or may not be uh be um blasphemous to some people but actually rdr2 is a pretty easy trash for me um of those three games i hold on an easy trash an easy trash for but you did pick the game as one of your most anticipated it is it is one of my most anticipated so go ahead and walk us through that yes so um I was very impressed by Red Dead Redemption, and I, I got to watch a little bit of it, but never played it. And actually, at a few points, I wanted to play it, but it was never out on a platform you, that I owned. You've got your black hat back, Chris. Yes, I've it's got my, back. It's back. <laughs> um, and so I, I, it, I'm, it's a game that I'm interested in experiencing, and I think that um, RDR2 is going to be a great way to experience for the first time because it's going to be bigger and more open world and prettier and whatever else. And so it's definitely it's up there on my list of things I want to try, and I think it's going to be a great game. So, you know, it's worth checking out and I am anticipating it. However, because I don't have any sort of um, emotional attachment to it, as it were, um, it's not hard for me to say I'm okay with not playing it. All right. That makes sense. Um, That makes sense. Now, between Valkyria Chronicles and Metroid Prime 4, that's where things start getting trickier because Valkyria Chronicles, I might have mentioned, is actually one of my favorite um, games of all time Hmm. Um, and kind of like a surprise game in that pick. It's maybe not my top, but it's like 
probably top 10 franchise wise. Um, and I was kind of disappointed in uh, Valkyria Re- Revolution. I think it was. It was kind of like an action RPG spinoff. Um, I haven't played very much of it, but it's not really gripping me the same way that the other ones did. Um, the first game was great. The second game I played a little bit, but it was just a PSP kind of, you know, straight to PSP sort of game. Um, and then three didn't even come out in the US. Uh, so four uh, is returning to console. Hopefully it's going to be a return to form. Super excited about it. And then, of course, Metroid Prime 4. The Metroid Prime games are also up there as, like, I think, top games of all time. Uh, and so this I one... I agree with you on that one, yeah. at least for the first one. And uh, we haven't seen much about Metroid Prime 4, but we just... It's Nintendo, and it's Metroid, and hopefully it's going to be good. It should be good. Uh, so, buying and trying. This is very, very tough. Um, I think if I had to pick, I'd say I'd, get, I'd buy Valkyria Chronicles because part of the greatness of those games is the story and i'd have to get through the whole story to like really fully appreciate the experience um metroid as amazing as i'm sure it's going to be um and a full game experience i'm sure is going to be great but i feel like i can kind of get enough of it with the try between the two um but obviously of course uh outside the game i'm buying metroid wow uh, i'm going to play all the way through and metroid. you're trashing red dead redemption i'm trashing too. red dead redemption so horrible uh, history's greatest monster over s- here s- send your hate mail to inbox <laughs> at backward dash compatible.com uh, i will have the hashtag chris bag segment yeah. that's great that's great <laughs> all right jim uh your okay. turn okay so you heard chris's answer here uh i want to know if you had to choose between RDR2 and Metroid Prime 4 and Mega Man 2. 11. Whatever. Um, it looks like the Roman numeral 2 up on yeah, the board. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an I. <laughs> Ro- Mega Man I, I. 11. It's sans serif, so it's ambiguous. There we go. Ah. And Mega Man 11, mm. what would you choose? Oh, geez. Yes, yeah, so this is a really tough call for me. I know. I, again. Um, I know. So let me let me walk through this. You're so already I'm, wrong. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with my I'm gonna start with my trash and build up kind of kind of as Chris did. I like that strategy. Don't let trash build up. Yes, Take it out. It I comes will. once a week. I will. Um, I'm gonna need. To, I'm gonna have to go ahead and trash Mega Man 11. And wow. I'm a big Mega Man fan, and I've actually been looking forward to this one. Um, I saw the gameplay videos, and it looks like a return to form for the series of the original style Mega Man games, and I mean from the from yeah. the NES, as well as Mega Man 9 and 10, which were kind of retro 8-bit throwbacks um, to the original six games that I thought were very successful. I enjoyed them very yeah. much. Um, Mega Man 11 is using the more you know more modern modern graphics looks like it's something that could be on like a p like the ps2 i mean or or more like you know some of the like the later mega man games but it has the gameplay style of the nes game so mm-hmm. that really interests me but i've played so many mega man games that if i had to pick between these you know there's 11 of them right and there's mm-hmm. actually more than 11 there's 11 in the main mega man series oh, sure, we're talking yeah. all the spinoffs we're talking a, a game series that has easily 30 entries in it so I, I feel I don't have to play another one. I just mm. want to. That makes sense. So I, I can go ahead and I can feel comfortable um, trashing this game. Um, so next, I'm going to have to pick... Oh, geez. Okay, so it's between my buy and my try. So I'm going to talk through this. Um, so Metroid Prime 4 is a game that I have been anticipating for some time. Mm-hmm. I still hold the original Metroid Prime as one of my all-time top 10 favorite games. And I, I think it still holds up to this day. I really enjoyed the sequels, not as much. I don't think they were quite as good, especially Metroid Prime um, 3. I had a problem with Metroid Prime 3 in the way that they um, added a few extra characters and kind of forced you to... The the way that they they, they, they took away your equipment and then you had to get it back was a little... I mean, it, it, it... I know it's Metro. They always have to find an excuse to make <laughs> you do it, but it felt a little derivative, a um, little, little forced. But I still really enjoyed the. Once I got into it, once I was able to explore the explore the space, I really enjoyed it. Amnesia. That's yes. the answer. Ah, <laughs> always um, the answer. Yes, yes. It's totally so, fresh and new. So Me- Metro Prime Four, I'm really looking forward to. And even though it's not by um, Retro Studios, I which which made the first three uh, Metroid Prime games, I'm still really looking forward to what they can do. Uh, particularly because it's on the Switch, and it is interesting here that I have picked some Switch games from most anticipated. I still do not own a Switch yet, <laughs> um, and if I could have picked a game that has already come out, I would have picked um, Mario Odyssey because mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm really anticipating 
playing that game. It's so, just already been so out. So Jim's most anticipated thing of 2018 is just getting a Switch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some games that I want to play. So Metroid, Metroid Prime 4 is on my list for sure, and it's going to be tough to pick between that and the other one that Doc uh, challenged me with, which was Red Dead Redemption 2. And we talked about that game earlier in the yeah, regular speculation. Yeah. I have been anticipating this game for some time. Uh, I do not hold the same level of, um, I should say almost almost a, a you know antis- anticipated disappointment that doc does for it I, I feel that i'm going to love this game i'm looking really forward to it a retro, uh the original red, red dead redemption is one of my favorite games of all time so this that's that's what makes this choice so difficult is that i have two two series that are um have some of my favorite games ever within them metroid prime and red dead redemption and now they have sequels that are coming out on new systems new experiences possibly bigger and better who knows right um and if they even if they do that storyline that I said with the three different um, characters and the good, the bad, the ugly reference um, or homage, I should say, I, I that makes it tough for me. So I'm going to say because there's so much content in Rockstar open world games and because Red Dead Redemption, I expect to have just as large of a, of a world as we saw in Grand Theft Auto V, which was frankly massive. Um, I have to pick that as my buy. Because I want to experience that full world. Um, so This does not surprise me. Yes. So very uh, unfortunately, even though I would, in, in reality, I'm going to play through the entire Metroid Prime 4. But in this hypothetical, um, I think I could get by with playing a few hours if it meant I was able to play all 100 hours that I would probably sink into Red Dead Redemption 2. So that will be my buy. And Metroid Prime 4 will be my try. And um, my trash, unfortunately... The, the odd duck out will be Mega Man Sorry, 11. guys. There's no such thing as Mega Man 11 now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Doc. Oh, um, no. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'm actually going to mix things up a little bit. Um, instead of, because you also uh, had a couple of other games that we just talked about. It's true, I did. Uh, but we'll save those for just a minute. Okay. And I'm going to go with a, a sort of dad theme here. Uh, so, you've got Nintendo Labo. Uh-huh. Uh, you've got Dad of War. I do. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's God of War. Yeah. But yeah. Yes. Well, no, I think I think Chris was right. Yeah. <laughs> no, all right. So you got you know the thing you want to play with your child uh-huh. as a dad. Uh-huh. You got Dad of War, uh-huh. uh, which and, I will not be playing with my child. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, a stretch. You've got uh, Far Cry Five. Um, you, you, the crying of a child and themes of fatherhood. Oh, dear. I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's a new experience for you. It's something <laughs> okay. you haven't played before. So right. You're right. That is a stretch. <laughs> yes. Very much. Um, but it's it's also something you said you haven't had an interest in him before. It's true. I so haven't. between that and the Labo, uh, it's kind of like new things for you. Oh, so. goodness. Oh, you're making this really hard. Okay. Well... You know, the reason why God of War is on there, even though I, I really have never... Mm, I haven't played to completion any of the God of Wars. I'll put it that way. Um, the first one came out on on what? PlayStation, original PlayStation 1? Was it PS2? PS3. No. No, PS2. It PS2. was PS2. It was, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but my my dad, uh, speaking of a dad theme here, <laughs> uh, my, my dad actually loved those games. He, and, and so I watched most of them whenever he would play them, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, and, you know, it, it was just kind of uh, interesting to see all the Greek gods and the Greek mythology and that sort of thing played through. What caught my attention with this new one that's coming out is that it's actually been relocated to Norse mythology. Really? Yes. And so it's actually not about the Greek gods at all. Uh, it's actually almost, it's it's like a soft reboot in the soft reboot tradition that is the current thing. Mm-hmm. Um and and so for whatever reason, I don't know the plot, but for whatever reason, he's up there and he's going to go do stuff with, you know, Thor and and, and things. Not Marvel Thor, but, mm-hmm. you know, actual Thor. Well, that's also loosely based on North Pole. Well, it's true. So. Yeah, it's, uh, never mind. It doesn't matter. The point <laughs> is this. Um, I have an interest in it, but actually that's the one that I would trash mm. in that um, if, if it didn't get made, I'd, I'd be okay with it. I was just slightly interested in it. Um from that perspective of, oh, it might actually be fresh. And there's a serious lack of fresh games in 2018. That's a different rant. So many remakes, so many sequels. Um, yeah, this is more of a kind of a reboot and a reimagining of the series, really. It's what, it, what it feels kind like to me. Of, yeah, except that it's the same uh, Kratos and it's his his son is, uh, you know, so, old so enough now or whatever. Kratos went and married a um, a goddess in Norse mythology. Uh, and so their son is being raised in the Norse tradition, but it's still the Greek god of that war. That is so not it, but yeah, okay. <laughs> um, 
as for the others, let's see. Um, Far Cry. Okay, so here's the thing. As I understand it, Far Cry actually takes place in America now, and it it has to do with like uh, a religious terrorist cell of some kind, and and you're you're going yeah, in and I, you're taking them down. I think and... it's I think it's um I'm not sure if they're if they're terrorists per se. I think they're a cult. I think it's like a, a right. religious cult. Right. Well, I was thinking sort of like uh you know Branch Davidian Waco. That's exactly what it is. No, no, that's thing. exactly yeah. what it is. There, it's like a Branch Davidian kind so of thing. So this is the first one that has interest me in that sense. But I've always liked um. At, at least in concept, the Far Cry um, open world idea with um, the weapons and the way things break down. And, and I always use that as an example uh, in my classes as what to do when creating a world. But the stories were never that compelling for me. Uh, this one is the first one where I'm kind of mildly interested. So I think, honestly, it'll come down to that one being my try. And then um, the buy is going to be the the, the Labo. Um, I'm really excited. Wow. I'm not surprised by this one either. No, he shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, but I'm really excited to play that with my son and mm. put the cardboard stuff together. And it just, it hits all the right notes for me, pun intended. Mm. Uh, when I can put a piano together out of cardboard and then stick my switch in there and my son's going to flip out. Mm. And um, it's kind of like, you know, you mentioned earlier, uh, you're into Lego. And so it kind of like hits that same sort yeah. of like, you know, putting and assembling, uh, you know. Yeah. And it's like I said before, it's augmented reality turned on its head. And that's super cool. Um, so, uh, you know, I really expect in my lifetime to be be seeing T-shirts with, with circuitry in it or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, a, a smart shirt that's like wash me and it emails me. Uh, we're going to get there. Uh, this is the first step to me um, heading in that direction and and really sort of training my son in that generation to expect his stuff to interact with him in a real way up on the screen or, you know, wherever. So, yeah, I'm excited. Cool. Game evolution. Um, so, Chris, mm-hmm. I will challenge you. Okay. Three more games. Your final three. Mm-hmm. Anticipated. Buy, try, or trash. The Wolf Among Us Season 2. Mm-hmm. Soul Calibur 6 or Final Fantasy Dissidia? Or is it Dissidia Final Fantasy? Dissidia Final Fantasy. I think it's like NT or something. I forget. In, off the I think I... you're right. It is NT, mm-hmm. which is a fighting game series. Correct? It is. It yes. is. Um, yeah. So Dissidia, for those of you who aren't familiar, is actually a, uh, I think it was actually made by the same people who did Kingdom Hearts, which is one of the things that intrigued me about it. It's an action RPG fighting game hybrid sort of thing. It's, huh. it's really interesting. When I first heard about it, it's like, it's the Final Fantasy fighting game. So I was expecting almost like, you know, side by side, you know, 3D, but like, you know, kind of Tekken style, Soul Calibur style, where you've got like two characters and they've got a moveset and they fight. It's actually a lot more like a, um, some of those like anime fighting games, if you're familiar, like Dragon Ball Z, Naruto, all those, where it's kind of like a third person, like lock on, move around. So it, oh, looks, okay. huh. it looks a little bit more like that than like, you know, a Tekken, for example. Um, but it's basically like an all-star cast from the Final Fantasy series where they're sort of like, it's this big old mashup and they get summoned to some world that where you know having villains fight heroes is a thing that's that happens it's a crossover it's you know (laughs) loose justification um but it's also very cool very well done i loved the heck out of the psp games uh back when they first came out and so um ever since that happened i was actually like hoping you know back still in the ps3 era that they would make a console version so you can get the better graphics and more cool effects and etc etc and so now finally we're actually getting a console dissidia um, for PS4. Mm. Uh, and that's why I'm looking forward to it is because I loved the game series and it's, I'm just excited to get back into it again. Uh, plus the, the addition of a few new characters who have come out since the last Dissidia did. Um, and then of course, Soul Calibur, I've been a huge fan of, uh, ever since I was in like third grade, I think, um, it was the first fighting game that I can kind of like really sink my teeth into, um, because it feels, it felt at the time. And I still think it's one of the more intuitive arcade style fighters, um in the sense that your moves have kind of like a predictable um sort of like you don't have to know the move set to be able to competently play various characters right you just get what is it what is his name Raphael, <laughs> yeah. and you just like button mash yeah that's how you win the game I, i've played it exactly um <laughs> that works every time but no it's like there's like you know one button is horizontal slash one is vertical slash and those tend to mean different things like one's kind of like shorter and quicker one is you know longer range but slower etc and then like things like grabs and counters um and so I've always really liked this game. Um, and now they're finally coming out with six. It's been many years since five came out. Uh, so these are just like two continuations of series that I really like. And then, of course, Wolf Among Us 2. Uh, that was one of our first uh, roundtables, actually, when we did season one. 
Um, I think it's one of Telltale's best works. Um, I think I would agree. I think at this yeah. point, um, Tales from the Borderlands is still the number one spot yes. for me. But this is a close second. Um, I think that they had really great storytelling in this one. Good decision making. Um, the world was cool. It's based off of the Vertigo comics. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so uh, what's the name of that series? It was like Fable. Fable. That's or is right. it Fables? Fables? I think it's Fables. I think plural. it's Fables. And so basically you're following the big bad wolf. Uh, as the main character, I'm curious to see if they keep that. I think it's probably going to remain the case. Um, but I'm, I, I think that this will be a return f- to form, hopefully, for Telltale, um, who have kind of disappointed me recently. They've been disappointing me for a while, honestly. Give me Borderlands Tales of Borderlands 2, yeah. and we'll mm-hmm. start talking return to form. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so with all that said, which ones am I buying, trying, and trashing? Uh, we ask you first. Yes. So I think... If I'm going to have to buy something, it's probably going to be The Wolf Among Us for the same reason, as I said, for Valkyria. It's about the story. I want to experience the full story. Uh, and so in order to do that, I'm going to have to buy the game. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, for trashing or trying, um, I think I'm probably going to have to try Dissidia because I've really? I, I've probably I've poured a lot of hours into huh. that game, but it's a newer series, relatively speaking. Uh-huh. You know, there are fewer games in the series. Um, I've played my fair share of Soul Calibur, and every time it comes out, it's kind of just like an updated version of the same. Um, whereas Dissidia feels like because it's an RPG, it's got a little bit more meat to it. Uh, it grows a little bit more, and of course, I won't be able to put as much time into it if I'm trying. But I'm I'm I think I'd be between the two more interested to try the new Dissidia over Soul Calibur. That's funny. I, I kind of know what to expect with Soul. Calibur. I had that completely backwards for you, actually, mm-hmm. completely. Mm-hmm. So, so oh. you're trashing Soul Calibur Six. I know. It pains me to say because mm-hmm. it's it's another mm-hmm. one of my old favorites, but harsh. Let the past wow. die. Kill it if you have to. Trash it if you have to. All right, so Jim, you've got three left on your list here. Uh-oh. Um, so it looks like it's No More Heroes, Travis Strikes Again, which I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Yakuza 6, which I only sort of know what that is. And then Project Octopath Travel Land. What? Traveler. Traveler. Are, are you making things up? <laughs> so you have a fake list, didn't you? You're actually, trolling yes. me, aren't you? I, 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 know, what all, I, win this I game. know what all three of those are. Yes. So. Um, okay. No, that's how I win the games. I just make up games. It's easy to trash them if they don't, don't actually exist. All right. So, uh, no, so is it going to be good. Octoland, Switch, uh, Yakuza 6, <laughs> or what? So these are, these are, in, these are good choices to, to group together because they're all um sort of quirkier games and two of them actually come out on the switch i mentioned before i had several games i'm most anticipated yeah, yeah. on our system i don't yet own um so talking these through so no more heroes is a, is a series of games there's been two of them so far and they're these really quirky japanese games about a an, an otaku which is sort of a japanese nerd mm-hmm. essentially um and it, it's, it's about this otaku named travis touchdown and he has he sort of gets a katana um, for some reason. I forget exactly how he gets it. But the, the point of the game is that he is enters enters into this, um, like, world assassin contest, mm-hmm. essentially, where he has to go around, or hitman contest, something like that, where he has to go around and defeat all these other hitmen. And so it's a really strange, uh, very strange, quirky Japanese game. And I, Chris, you may have played one or two of these. I didn't play them, but I saw a good chunk. Yeah. And um, this is by the same people who did uh, Killer 6, right? Uh, killer, my... killer is dead. Killer is dead. Yes. The game you gave me thing. Oh yeah, Killer mm-hmm. Six too. Yes, you're right. Both of them. Um, yes. So they're very, very stylized. Very stylized games. Like yeah. Hyper violent in a, but in a not serious way. Right. Yes. Yeah. You, and honestly, I think you'd probably enjoy these games. Mm-hmm. So you might. I would recommend you probably pick up the one on Switch. Yeah. yeah. Uh, assuming I don't decide to trash it, in which case no one gets to play it. <laughs> uh, but we'll have to see. But I know I'm interested that there hasn't been a sequel in a while, and I'm actually quite interested to see what they do with the Switch. Um. And uh, and given how strange this developer is, this is by Suda Fifty One is That's the name the of the I developer. Of, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, and um, he always does these strange games. And honestly, given how we- how strange he is, I would not be surprised if he. If somehow he ends up incorporating something from the Nintendo Labo, that mm. wouldn't surprise me at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm dead make, serious. Making the sword, uh, yeah, yeah. Or, or it, yes. Because it's kind of like a light sword almost. It it's, is. It's yeah. a lightsaber, actually. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, th- the thing about it that's, that they that they did, because it came out on the Wii, the way that you would charge it is that you would have to shake it. Mm-hmm. And he did it on purpose because it was essentially sexually suggestive. It was a big joke to mm-hmm. him. So the whole game was very much a weird strange quirky tongue in cheek tongue in cheek yeah. violent but but not in a um it's a, like a ridiculous ridiculous violence. over the top like yeah. don't take it seriously kind like of, like kind you'll of you'll cut someone in half and blood will like spray up like six times their height like just 
<laughs> yeah, it was it was a very strange game, and all of the 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 hitmen that you had to go and I, and I keep using that term hitmen. I honestly can't remember. They had a specific name of mm-hmm. what they were, the organization they were in. But you were essentially trying to get to the top. The only way you could do that is by defeating them, and they all had their weird, strange quirks, mm-hmm. right? So a uh, really fun game if if you're into if you're into anime and that and that style of Japanese storytelling, it's worth playing. Um, so that's why I'm interested in the newest one. Yakuza 6, Song of Life. This is a new one for me to anticipate because I only got into the the Yakuza series recently, as in only a few months ago. Mm -hmm. I had heard of these games before. They're open world. um, It's kind of like a Japanese take on grand theft auto and they but, were basically remade or, or hd re, re-released right yeah so the one that i played recently yakuza kiwami was one of my game of the year candidates when we talked right. about last show and it was a remake of the original game and i absolutely loved it yakuza zero is a prequel to the whole yakuza series that i picked up after playing kiwami and i'm still playing through it. it's a massive game and i'm enjoying it quite a bit too this is a series of games that is is probably probably a little more closer and in, incomparable in style to shinmu because it's um you don't use guns you have unarmed combat that kind of thing sega lots of sega arcades and things like that around but um lots of really strange side quests very heavy storytelling very dramatic um in the cutscenes. but then the actual gameplay itself is very over the top um it's a game that that really likes to to, to straddle the line between serious and um corny and just just you know satire um but i love it 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 embraces it embraces all of that to make it to really give you a unique experience and so i'm really excited for yakuza 6 even though i haven't played yakuza the storyline for yakuza between 2 and 5 and i probably won't be able to for a while because i'm going to be waiting on the remakes to come out the the new kawami versions um i want i want to play 6 i want to see it in the new on a new engine because the games i've played are in a ps3 engine i want to see a ps4 engine i want to play the new content and um, I'm really looking forward to this one. Mm-hmm. And then the final game on my list here, Project Octopath Traveler. <laughs> and this was one that um, actually is one of the games that encouraged me to look more into the Switch and, and want to pick one up. Um, so it's a Square Enix game, and it is a, an RPG that is has been described. So it's by um, – they're working on it, but also Acquire is kind of the developing house that's mainly, work, that's mainly developing it. Um, they they call the aesthetic HD 2D because it's basically a 16-bit style character sprites, but they're using textures and polygons and high definition effects. So it gives you this really unique um, look that is both nostalgic and new, which I like. I really like the visuals. The, the trailers are very pretty. The, the trailers are very pretty. Um, and the storyline is supposed to be. I mean, it is a fantasy game, but what I like about the story is less the specific content. And more the style. You're going to play through with multiple different characters and get their perspectives. And are there me- eight characters? Uh, yes, actually, yes, there are. Um, you figured it out. Ah. Um, so it's it reminded me of Romancing Saga. Uh, I played a couple of those for the Super Nintendo and actually fan translations because they never came to the U.S. But Is that a dating sim? Or? No, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. It was a, it was a fan, Final Fantasy style mm. RPG. But the big twist being you get to play as different characters and you get to understand sort of their experiences. And um, I, I found that very interesting. I mean, it's you, more the traditional use of the word romance. Yes, yeah. precisely. Mm. Um, and so this game is is taking after that as well. So I want to kind of see where it goes. That being said... It's a very tough choice for me. Um, so I will once again start with... Actually, I'm going to go backwards this time, and I'm going to do my buy first. I have to buy Yakuza 6. <laughs> um, I'm really into this series now. I'm all in. I absolutely love it. I think the, the style fits very well because it, it allows me to have those really serious, dramatic, and surprisingly well-written Yakuza stories. Stories, And by that, I mean stories about the Yakuza, um, Japanese gangsters. Um, and... Yet also have those those moments, and actually a lot more than moments, a lot lengthier, of um, just laughter and fun and strangeness and just the bizarre nature of the games. I have to play this game, and, and they're they are so big, I couldn't just play this for an hour to really understand it. I have to play the full time. Um, for my try, I'm going to have to pick No More Heroes. I mean, mm. I want to try this game, and I feel that I can get a good experience with this game. Uh, and, and and understand it by only playing a few hours. Mm-hmm. And th- honestly, that's why I'm picking Project Octopath Traveler from my trash. Mm. Uh, more because I feel that I'm only going to really 
get to enjoy this game because of what I feel is going to be a rich story if I play it all the way through. Mm. And so I, if you all, have to buy Yakuza, then yes, that's just so you'd rather not play it at all. Yeah, exactly. That so that's where I'm going trash. Um, but it's a tough call. All right, full circle, Doc. Uh, we alluded to this a little while ago, but Uh-oh. you also have a couple of games that uh, Jim and I both uh, were deliberating. I do indeed. Uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, Metroid Prime 4, and uh, one that I actually didn't know was coming out, but I know that you're a fan of, um, Metro. Well, yeah, it's actually Metro Exodus. It's the third one uh, in the Metro 2033 series, Mm -hmm. um, which is named for uh, the post-apocalypse nuclear apocalypse, which happens in 2013. This is made by a a Ukrainian developing Um, studio, correct? Well, you know, there's kind of an interesting story behind it. It, It's all based on uh, Dmitry Glukovsky's novels. And so there's a huge transmedia, cross-media kind of uh, world out there. And he did one of the rather unusual things, um, which is to open up that world and say, guys, write in this, basically um, endorsing the fan fiction, if you will, and say, whatever you write in this world, canon. <laughs> and and that's a thing that we haven't really uh, seen much of, you know, protecting the, the copyright it's, of your world. It's putting a lot of thing. trust in. Wait, <laughs> it's very much a Call of Cthulhu type f- thing. You know what I mean? So he opened it up to the internet and said, anything yeah. you write is canon. Yeah. And it hasn't been completely corrupted and destroyed yet? No. And in okay. fact, it surprises me. Yeah. In fact, it's a very rich and wonderful world. It takes place um, primarily as um, the, the metro system in Moscow, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in Russia. Uh, they sheltered in the tunnels when the bombs fell. Basically. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, then, and then civilization sort of comes out of there and, and the story is about that. Um, so this is the third one in the series. It picks up right where the second one, um, you know, ends up. Now, to be fair, I have not spent much gameplay time in this world. Uh, and, and I've spent very little, um, let's call it narrative time in the world with the, with the translations and various things. But uh, I, I've had enough people who uh, have been interested in it and um, like student presentations and things like that, where I know enough about the world to be uh, really a kind of a fan, casual fan, if you will, a lurker fan yep. of it. I, I was in that same class or someone to gave that yeah. presentation on the trains. That's right. You were, I'd yeah. forgotten that. Um, but what it really comes down to is, is this, it's a bit like fallout except in Russia and serious. And in that alone, it interests me. Mm-hmm. Um, so any of the, the cornball stuff about that sort of neo retro world of fallout that you don't like, mm. I think you'd find your happy place in Metro as a speculation, as a fan. Huh. Um, now, Interesting. I, I mean, you're putting I, I this love, game on my radar, too. I really am. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I love Fallout mm. for what it is, but if someone didn't, I'd say Metro would be your, your go-to. Um, so that said, um, I would love to try it, but I don't think I would buy it. So that's my try on this uh, magical list of three, which then brings it down to... Uh, very difficult choice for me because, you know, I ranted a little bit earlier about Red Dead Redemption. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not sure I want to spend money on it, but I definitely, I definitely, and the, in, in re, it's funny, in real life, I may end up trying it and not liking it and then not buying it, if you know what I mean. But in the context of this game, mm. I think I would buy it. It would be the one that I would buy. And um, that, Prime, does, that surprises me. It, I gotta well, say, you know, yeah. Prime would be the one that I would trash uh, just because I have a deep respect for Metroid, but I'm not, I'm not really a Metroid fan boy um, in the sense that I must play it. And I followed the series and all that sort of thing. I honestly, I got further into the, uh, the Metroid two remake, the, you know, AM2R or whatever it was yes, uh, than AM2R. I had any other Metroid game ever. I, I've never beaten a Metroid game. I never got to that magical moment where she takes off her helmet. You're like, oh my goodness, Metroid's a girl. Um, you know, it's, it's like... Send yeah. your hate mail. I know, all right. But, uh, but I, I honestly think I could be very, very forgiving of uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. But awesome. The truth is, it's a lean year for me. There's just literally nothing out there I'm as excited about as I was last year. Last year, I was falling all over myself for three or four games that were going to come out. Um, and they were disappointments. Yeah. The next game I'm going to grab um, is, is actually a uh, hob. Mm. And I'm really excited about to play that one. It's a little indie game along the lines of rhyme. So, uh, but it's already out. So it, it doesn't qualify for this list. Uh, and so thank you for joining us everyone for episode 120 of the backward dash compelled.com podcast. Our, uh, our little game on uh, our most anticipated games of 2018. 
And of course, we'd like to encourage you to um, write into the show. Uh, we're trying to sort of increase the audience interaction. Uh, you can support the show by uh, sharing us with your friends. Um, if you see us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, you know, like, uh, comment, subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. Our goal right now is to uh, grow the show, grow the audience, and uh, to interact with you guys more. So definitely share us right in. And uh, we're totally happy to uh, talk about stuff that you find interesting. Uh, so anyway, I'm the good. I'm the bad. Wait a minute. (laughs) (laughs) And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.